started on something and I didn't quite finish it. So I'm going to give you the conclusion of the matter today. I'm not going to do a lot of review. If you want to review it, it's on the podcast. Amen. Or you can go back and through the archives on Facebook and uh, September 13th. Got that? All right. All right. All right. All right. So Titus, Titus chapter two, Titus chapter two. While y'all doing that, I'm going to cut this off over here. Titus chapter 2. Ooh. Y'all got it? If not, you're in the vicinity, right? <laughs> All right. Titus chapter 2, we're going to start at uh, verse 1, and it says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, To be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Verse 6 says, likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed having neither evil to say of you. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that may, be, uh, that may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And that's where we're going to stop. I know that was a lot. But it's the conclusion of soundtrack. What does your life sound like? You can be seated. Um, I'm going to say this now because I might forget at the end. Uh, Bishop and Pastor Barbara are uh, in Rocky Mount this morning uh, with Apostle Anderson. And he wanted me to inform you when we're done here, you need to tune in there. (laughs) He's going to continue in the Increase series. Uh, so that's why he wants you to tune in. He don't want you to miss out. So when he comes back next week, you can, you, you'll be able to keep right up. We're going to share it on our Facebook page. It'll be on the UCAI Facebook page. But yes, make sure that you tune in to the next installment of that Increase series. This, this is a good series. Uh, I'm enjoying it. All right. So now, this entire chapter contains Paul's instructions to Titus. Titus was a a pastor of a congregation in Crete. Um, I'm sure he probably has some folks kind of like what we got around here, but I'm not going to dive into too much. Uh, So he he was seeking some advice. And so Paul's advice uh, specifically addresses how Christians should conduct themselves, especially in our general attitudes toward each other. Um, And verse 10 sums it up nicely um, that believers should behave in such a way that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. Okay? So, we're all familiar with magnets, right? Okay, they have two poles, the North Pole, South Pole. And when you put the, what is it, the two Norths together, they repel, or two, if two of the same poles together, they repel. Opposite poles, they attract. Okay? That is kind of um, what our lives are. We're like magnets. Um, We can either attract or repel people to the kingdom. And our job is to attract, not repel. Our lifestyles and our attitudes are 
either a magnet or a repellent for other people concerning the gospel we claim to believe. Uh, as Christians, we should draw people toward the truth of the gospel by the way we live, not drive them away with our frown faces, our short answers, um, you know, not speaking to one another, or we have our little circles and cliques. Not this church, but um, I'm sure there's somewhere around there, you know, you just, you don't quite greet people like you should, or uh, some folks you just don't talk to at all, or, you know, but not here, just places like here. Okay, so. I'm just saying. Believers should be known for joy. And we know what joy is, Jesus, others, and then yourself. Because when you have that real relationship with Jesus, all you want to do is put others first, which in turn puts you in a place of jubilation and excitement because you were used to be a blessing to someone else and to further the kingdom. Not because our lives are without trouble, but because our ultimate hope is founded on the unchanging nature of God. Unfortunately, too many people uh, who call themselves Christians, y'all know that statement, are known for joylessness, complaining and treating others harshly. They have a reputation that uh, is least like Jesus and more reflective of, y'all remember the character from Sesame Street, Oscar the Grouch? He was only happy and trash. When everything was going good, he was dissatisfied. You know, he wanted the junk, he wanted the mess, he wanted the filth, he wanted, he w that's when he was cool. But as soon as, you know, stuff got cleaned up, he was, he was not happy. He didn't want stuff to go smooth, he didn't want it to go, okay, all right, I'm, 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 I'm going to leave that right there. Um, those folks who are always complaining, always seeing the negative in every situation, somebody uh, who needs an attitude, or I like to say an altitude adjustment. Um, we shouldn't slap a fake smile on our faces but if we are in Christ, the joy of the Lord should certainly be something we are characterized by, even in the trials and sorrows of life. So how do we do that, even when our lives are turned upside down or in utter chaos? I think I got an answer for that. Uh, some of us truly need an altitude adjustment. Altitude, yeah. Synonymous with attitude, but I, I like altitude. Go with me here on this one. See, what happens uh, is when our minds aren't renewed constantly with the word of God, you can't see the forest for the trees. You're walking around in the midst of mess of life situations or you become consumed with what the old folks call the storms of life. A storm out over the ocean. <laughs> Has anyone ever flown on a plane? So, you, Okay. Then, then you guys can relate to, th to this next part. See, on the way to the airport, even while sitting on the plane or on the runway, your vision is limited. You can only see what's in front of you. Even on a rainy or stormy day, everything looks dreary and hopeless. But see, something begins to happen. When you get on that plane, it starts to roll down the tarmac, takes off, and as it continues to climb, all of a sudden things begin to change your view begins to expand. Even on those rainy and stormy days, now you begin to, to, to see a peak of sunshine on the horizon, and as the plane continues to climb and burst through the clouds, all of a sudden, all the rain is gone. All you see is bright sunshine. When you look down, all you see is clouds beneath you because all that mess that was there is no longer visible to you. Why? Because you had an altitude adjustment. See, all the, all, all the mess, the foolishness, everything begins to change. Now, everything that was an issue is no longer an issue because you've risen above the mess. So goes life. Once the word is in your heart, not just a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge, a lifestyle now or a mindset begins to take off and your altitude begins to change and everything that was a problem for you is no longer a problem because instead of walking around in the storms of life or the situations, now you are looking down on them in a different, from a different perspective. Amen. See, the, 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 the storms didn't cease. The mess didn't clean up. But you're no longer in it. Your perspective has changed. 
So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a thing of, okay, everything just stopped and now everything is perfect and I'm just going to go on in Jesus name. No, life happens. We are, we are in an earthly body in an earthly domain and there's certain things that we cannot control. But the one thing we can control is us. Now, when your uh, perspective begins to change, those things that once bothered you no longer bother you. Some of you are dealing with mess that you shouldn't even be dealing with because there is a gap in your relationship. We want to pray and ask God to, to get us out of some things that we were never meant for because he already gave us the tools that we needed to deal with those issues. God help me. God said, you know, like, y'all ever heard that story about the, um, the, 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 the man who was out in the ocean, shipwrecked, yeah. praying for the Lord to deliver him. He sent a boat. No, I'm waiting on God to deliver me. <laughs> sent a cruise ship. You need, no, I'm waiting on God to deliver me. Helicopter. No, no, I'm trusting God to, to deliver me. I'm just, you know. We're going to leave that there. Moving on. <laughs> As believers... We can't blame our tendency to be negative, critical, or complaining um, on our personality. It's really just a cover-up for being immature. We're all called and equipped to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. In Titus 2 and 12, it teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Uh, The fruit of the Spirit is the same for every Christian. The joy and gentleness of the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives transforms every personality into the image of Christ and into the very best version of ourselves. Uh, Yesterday in Men's Fellowship, we had a brother who was talking about uh, self-improvement. And we were were explaining to him that self-improvement is nothing but restraint. Because... When, when you're doing it yourself, that's all you can do is restrain yourself. You can't remove anything from yourself because you're not your own. You were bought with a price. That would be like a car having an issue where the engine wouldn't start or something like that. And it decides, I'm going to fix it myself. I'm going to be self-improved. I'm going to do better and I'm going to start. Where they do that at? And if you find one, let me know so I can get one. That'd be a nice car to have. So we can't rely on self-improvement. We need Christ. So understanding this, that kind of squashes the statements, that's just the way I am. Or God made me this way. If our purpose is to draw others to Christ, how can we do this without a smile or kind word? Church or this building uh, ought to be one of the warmest and most inviting places in the city. From the time you enter the parking lot to the time service ends, you ought to be so consumed and overwhelmed by the presence of God on display through his people that you don't want to leave. And when you do, you can't wait for the opportunity to return. So drawing others to Christ is bigger than just going out and inviting folks to church, although that is good. uh, We should be doing that. But what does your life look like? What is the soundtrack of your life? Are we showing a pattern of good works through our integrity, incorruptibility, and sound speech? In other words, are we living a lifestyle of worship? Worship can be an act. This is true, but it's so much more than that. It is a lifestyle. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a second and we're going to look at worship. And for some, it'll be a review uh, because this, this is nothing that, Uh, Bishop has not talked to us before. But sometimes you just need a little refresher. So let's let's see if we can do a simple review of worship. Uh, To keep it simple, worship is declaring the greatness of someone or something. It is the act of giving up your own glory to make sure everyone knows that the thing being worshipped is all that matters. In other words, worship is bowing down to lift up. In Christian circles, worship is often attached to a certain type of music. Uh, On the radio, it fills uh, the musical portion of our services. 
Uh, while music is a vehicle by which many people worship, and rightly so, it's not worship in its totality. That's like calling a slice of pizza a pizza. No, it's just a piece of pizza or a slice of pizza. It is not the whole kit and caboodle. Worship is simply a response to the presence of God. The act of worship can be just about anything that honors God. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12 and 1 in the NIV, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And also in 1 Corinthians 10 and 31 of the NIV says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. See, I kind of like this scripture here. It said eating is worship. <laughs> you know, some of us like to eat a little bit. So I'm, um, anyway. <laughs> so let's look at the Bible's definition of worship. The first time the word worship appears in the King James is in Genesis 22 and 5. When Abraham told his servants he would go worship on the mountain with Isaac. The Hebrew word for this usage of worship is shaka, meaning to bow down. Shaka, S-H-A-C-H-A-H, shaka. Now, this Hebrew word actually appears uh, prior to the first transitional occurrence. The, uh, the real first appearance of shaka is in Genesis 18 and 2. In this passage, God appears to Abraham in the desert as three persons. In this instance, the King James translate the word, uh, to mo the word more literally to say uh, Abraham ran to meet them and welcomed them by bowing low to the ground. So bowing down seems to be an appropriate act, action uh, when meeting with the creator. Bowing and kneeling are certainly appropriate responses to God's worship. If I can continue with this word study, another aspect of worship appears in Genesis 4, uh, verses 3 and 4. This verse says, Cain and Abel brought their offering to the Lord, and in the Hebrew, offering is uh, translated to minka. This word is defined as a gift, offering, a present, tribute, or a sacrifice. So worship is used about 40 times um, in Leviticus when it describes how to sacrifice and bring offering to God. So uh, according to a quick Old Testament study, uh, another definition of worship would be bowing down in homage and laying down or giving up something you, can, you care about to honor God. So worship requires you to give up something. It requires a sacrifice. We no longer have to, you know, bring in an animal and chop them up, put them on the altar and all that. But now it requires you because, as we stated earlier, now we are a living yes. sacrifice. Yes. So I know a lot of people, you know, aren't big on the Old Testament because it's Old Testament. Christ came and changed everything. So I got something for you, too. We'll look at what the New Testament says about worship. And I'm going somewhere with this, so y'all just hang in there. You may be surprised to find that the New Testament pretty much says the same thing as the Old Testament. The resurrection didn't change what worship is. It just changed some of the methods. It gave us a little more freedom in our worship. Whereas we had to go through a priest before, now the veil has been taken down and we have direct access. So in Matthew 2 and 2, the first time worship appears in the New Testament, the wise men had told Herod they, came, they had come to worship or proskuneo the new king. We've heard that word here before. Uh, one of the definitions is to kiss the face of, but the one that I want to fo focus on in the Greek translation, uh, and just in case you didn't know, New Testament is Greek, Old Testament is Hebrew. That's just, that one's for free. Um, the Greek translation means to fall upon the knees and touch the ground with the forehead as an expression of profound reverence. Sounds like the same meaning in the Old Testament, right? So now the next thing is how does Jesus define worship? So let's look at that. What is true worship? 
in John chapter 4, verses 20 through 24, is possibly Jesus' most direct definition of worship in the Bible. It could be the most well-known scripture on worship, yet it leaves readers to be like, huh? Jesus says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such, a wor uh, such to worship him. So the reason I say that it leaves readers like, huh, because do we really understand what it is to worship in spirit and in truth? So let's look at those words separately. If we look at worshiping in spirit, Jesus says that God is a spirit, so we should worship him in spirit in John 4.24. So I, I'm, I'm going to go to the Greek again. The English word spirit corresponds with the Greek word pneuma, pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, -E pneuma, which literally means a gentle blast of wind. Now, certainly Christ isn't referring to the wind. He's speaking of an invisible force like the wind, namely the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit. In other words, God can be everywhere and do all sorts of things all around you. And even when you don't directly perceive or see him, he's still working. So the same word is used to describe man's spirit. His essence separate from the body that determines his will, actions, and decisions. We are created in God's image. So it's no surprise that we too have a spirit. But for the moment, our spirit is confined to an enclosure, while God's is not. See, when God set the earth in place, one of the rules he had in place for the earth is that spirits cannot move about without a body. So we had to be he had to create a body to house our spirit for the time that we're here on earth. See, y'all still with me? All right. So we have a spirit, and God is a spirit. So how do we worship him in spirit? It is my belief that worshiping God in spirit means to connect with God on a non-physical level. Worship should not be about rituals, shouldn't be about traditions, or even a physical building. It shouldn't be about the order of service or how it flows or, or, or neither does worship need to consist of rehearsed prayers or songs, whether they be individual or corporate. Now, having said that, let's understand that songs and prayers, they can be vehicles to worship. They take us to a point of worship, but it is not within itself worship. Worship is possible anywhere, whether I have music or not. Whether I have lyrics or a screen or not, my worship is not confined to this building. No external force whatsoever can restrain worship in the spirit. Spiritual worship, if you will, is wholehearted, unfettered adoration from within response to God's presence. A good example of this uh, would be um, David. Uh, am I cutting out? Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay, here we go. A good, a good biblical example of pure worship uh, would be in 2 Samuel chapter 6 when David danced with all of his might, yeah. leaping and dancing as he brought the Ark of Covenant into the city. Even his own wife teased him. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bad thing when your wife teased you. Boy. <laughs> but that's how focused he was. He didn't care what nobody thought. That was his unfettered adoration to the presence of God. This worship in the spirit is heartfelt, unscripted, unhindered, and a grateful connection with God. So let's look at truth. There are no surprises when examining the word truth in the Greek. It means just what it does in English, that which is true. Worshiping in truth is in lockstep with worshiping in spirit. There should be no church faces. Y'all know I'm talking about church faces. You know, you, 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 in here. And as soon as you get through that second set of doors, child, let me tell you something. <laughs> if you loud, you just loud. Uh, why change who you are? I'm, I'm going to leave that. <laughs> 
So, yeah, y'all know about them church faces. Not y'all, but people like y'all. There's no such thing as faking it till you make it. There, there, there should be no other ulterior motives. For example, let's look at an onion. Onion has layers, right? Every layer of onion you peel off, what you get? More onion. Then you peel off the next layer, still onion. I don't care how many layers you peel off. That should be us. That should be us. We should be consistent all the way through, no matter where we are. No matter who we're around, no matter what we're doing, we should be who God created us to be. I love that Jesus says God is seeking out those true worshipers. It's exciting to know that God pursues you if you worship him in spirit and in truth. So in summary, yeah, we about to pull it together. It might be a short summary. It might be a long summary. I don't know. It just depends on how it goes. It's something about this space up here. Um, um, <laughs> to bring it all together, what should the soundtrack of our lives be? To put it in the most simple term, simplest terms, it should be worship. When we live a lifestyle of worship, or when everything we do or every decision we make is to please God or to let everyone know that God is all that matters, then how difficult is it to walk around with a smile on your face or to greet each other in a warm manner or invite someone to church or just genuinely be nice to each other? If my goal is to show you that the only thing in my life that matters to me is Christ or the kingdom, why would joy be an issue? Because when we understand that joy is Jesus, others, and then yourself, and the Great Commission also says that we are to go into all the world and make disciples in order to build the kingdom, then the only conclusion that we can draw is that the soundtrack of our lives should be worship and in living a lifestyle of worship. My love game should be strong. See, they go hand in hand. So with my love game being strong, I can now be an example that draws Christ, draws to Christ, not repels. If my job is to love you like I love me, I'm going to treat you the way I want someone to treat me if I were you. No matter the state that the person is in, no matter what others think or say, I'm still going to treat and respond to you the way that God would because that is my job is to reflect him and to let you know that the only thing that matters to me is him. So Philippians 1.11 in the Message Bible says this. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus will be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. That's what our love, our, our, the soundtrack of our life should be. It should be a, so much, we should be so consumed with a lifestyle of worship that whenever we come in contact with anyone, all they experience is the presence of God. Because if I'm consumed in worship, then he consumes, he's consumed me, which means that all that comes out of me is him. And so now if all that's coming out of me is him, why would, not, why would that not draw someone to him? Because they're not coming in contact with me, coming in contact with him. So the soundtrack of our lives is a lifestyle of worship. That's it, y'all. Just that simple. We're going to pray here. 
Father, we thank you and we give you praise for these words. Father, we thank you for demonstrating yourself. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to correct the areas that we've missed. God, our desire is to be totally and completely consumed by you. Father, we ask that you would consume our thoughts, consume our mind, consume our decisions. Let everything that we say, let everything we do, Father, be a reflection of you. No decision we make, no matter how small it is, Father, don't let it be consumed with us, but only the desire to please you. And we thank you, Father, for your presence and your anointing that draws, not to ourselves, God, but to you. Our goal and our desire is to be a reflection of you in this earth realm to build the kingdom. We love you. We praise you, God. We thank you for, for this opportunity, and we give you glory in Jesus' name. And now, before we wrap this thing up, I'm talking to the folks on Facebook now. Um. Some of you, may, it might be some people in this room, I'm not going to limit it to Facebook, but some of you may not have had the opportunity, I'm kind of stealing your thunder, Minister Jones, but I got you on the back end. Some of you might not have had the opportunity to accept Christ as your own personal savior. So you might not have a clue what we're talking about, a lifestyle of worship or, or anything of that nature. And I want to extend the opportunity to everyone in this room and everyone watching right now. It's as simple as ABC. First, admit that you're a sinner. Second, believe that Christ died for your sins. And thirdly, confess that he's Lord of your life. Three simple steps. And there may be somebody watching who wants to do it now, or maybe somebody in this room who wants to do that now. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray, and you just pray this simple prayer with me. Amen. Say, Father, Father, I thank you, I thank you for, sending for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Die for thank you, Father. For the, for the opportunity of repentance. Of repentance. I, confess I confess that I am a sinner. I, am a sinner. I, have I have missed the mark. But because of the blood of Jesus, of of Jesus. I, thank I thank you for the opportunity, for the opportunity to, enter to enter your kingdom. Come into my heart. Into my heart. Be, my Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be, my Savior. Be Lord of my thoughts. Lord over my life. Lord, my life. Thank, you, Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit. Consuming, me. consuming me. And God, and God I, write, I, I, confess right now I confess right now that you were Lord, you were Lord over, my life, over my life, and I will forever, I will forever serve, you. serve you. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. amen. Just that simple. So, whether... Whether you're in here or you're watching online, we welcome you into the kingdom of God. We, th we, we, we are so excited. We're rejoicing with you and with the angels in heaven for your return. Um, if you're watching and you, you happen to pray that prayer with us, please send us a message and let us know so we can contact you and, and, and connect with you and pray with you and make sure that we connect you with the local church so that you can continue to grow on this kingdom walk. No one is meant to walk this journey alone, even though it is a lonely walk. What does that mean? It means that when this thing is all said and done, I have to answer for my decisions, not anyone else's. But it's always good to have somebody who can be right there with you, praying with you, and walking this journey next to you. All right, having said that, we're wrapping up. Thank you for watching today. Thank you for tuning in. We love you. God bless you. We can't wait to see you again. Have an amazing week. And just in case your week is not so amazing, make sure it has an amazing you in it. God bless you. We love you. And we'll see you next time.